as we can with all of you. And we want to make sure we respect your time to be able to get out into service and 10 minutes before um, service starts. And we are still teaching out of boundaries in a marriage. And I'm so grateful that Jen um, and Michael, that Jen had talked about that she wanted a book on boundaries, um, some type of boundaries. And um, and I really think Jen was, Jennifer was because you wanted to learn, establish boundaries with your parents and everything that was going on and stuff like that, right? Well, I had to, I had to learn to. I mean, I, I guess she was caught on a hook. I mean, a lot of the questions that came about how do you set those healthy boundaries yeah. and when God walked me through that, I'm not perfect. It was one of those things like you need to have those steps. Yes, and I agree. And if you, there also is a book um, that he wrote, um, the author, on boundaries, just plain boundaries that I read years and years ago. And it's really good because it talks about how you set boundaries with your children and friends and family. And um, we all have boundaries that we need to set in different areas, but this one was for marriage. And this chapter is chapter 13, Six Kinds of Conflict. Before we get started, we're going to pray. Do you want to pray? Or do you want to pray? I'll pray. Okay, great. Thank you, beloved Father God, for each and every single opportunity that you give us to, to come together, to feed into our marriages, to pour into our marriages. We, we are either uh, creating a, a storage for the times when we need your strength, or we're feeding into and healing our marriages, even this moment, this very second. Let the words that come out of Michelle and I's mouths not be our thoughts or our, our feelings, but words guided by the Holy Spirit for those that are in this room. Let this be a, a gathering of, of all of us together, uh, praising you, beloved Father God and your Son, Jesus Christ, in the healing that you're going to be doing in our marriages, feeding into us or clo closing the wounds that may be in our heart or nurturing our souls and nurturing our marriages and our families as we may need it. Thank you again for every opportunity you give us. In your mighty name, amen. Amen, amen. Um, so before we get started, I just wanted to say something to you that <laughs> as you're praying, I want to just thank you for being such an amazing man and such an amazing husband. You're not perfect. I know that. Oh, we both know that. And, um, and I want to thank you for um, allowing God to grow you and stretch you and for you showing up every single week. And thank you for never giving up on our marriage or this ministry. Amen. So thank you. Amen. Thank you so much. So before we even get into the chapter... I, when when I was doing the outlines, which you should have those on your seats here, um, I, I heard a quote. I'm not going to really go into it um, and where it was from, but when I looked at the chapter, when we're talking about conflict, um, conflict has has two very probable outcomes. And this quote is something that really laid heavy on me talking about the two possible directions of outcome of, of conflict. Conflict can have the general effect of either creating a wedge in resentment and tearing people apart, or if you look at a conflict as an opportunity, because God puts us together to heal each other, and I love that, and it's one of the things that always, always makes me feel so much better if I have an argument with my wife. God puts us together to heal each other. So when there's conflict, I always try to look at the opportunity. But when I was looking at, 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 these, at this lesson plan, and I, I, I thought about this quote, I, I kind of want this to be at the forefront of your thoughts as kind of a, an aha, or, hmm, let's think about that. So the question was asked, when I first met you, you said that you, you, what you needed was a time machine. Where would you go if you, if you had a time machine? The person replied, I would go back two years. That's when I lost him. That's when he became distant and buried himself in work. He shut me out. Everybody thinks that I cheated on him. But he left me. Two years ago. He left me for reasons I still don't understand. And then he left me seven weeks ago when he took his own life. Not for someone, just for nothing. 
You asked me why I wasn't ready to take my ring off earlier. And it's because I should have either taken my ring off two years ago when I stopped fighting. Or I should have made the decision to fight for him and fight for our marriage. And in a nutshell on that is the backstory is he committed suicide and she did have an affair towards the end before he committed suicide. And she is talking to a friend saying, everybody's looking at me and what I've done wrong. And I had infidelity, but he left me two years ago. And what she means by that is he was still in the home, but he was no longer in the, in the marriage. And I watched today. So today's going to be an emotional day for me. I'm just warning you right now. Um, I've been emotional all day. We had the pleasure of being at a friend's party before we came here. And they're really, they're really dear to us. We love them so much. They've been married for quite some time, and they're young, like we are. Like they're saying, they get as a compliment. <laughs> that, was, that was a backward side comment. Compliment. He had slowly, several years ago, started to feel like he couldn't remember things. And um, we all say that, like, I can't remember her name, or I can't remember where my keys are. And he slowly started to go to the doctor, and they said nothing's wrong. At one point, they even told him he should see a psychiatrist. And uh, he got a new position after being at a bank for like 20, 25 years, the same bank. And he could not find his way out of the parking lot. And he was, you know, in his early 50s. And they started to diagnose him and do some brain scans. And they realized in his young age that he had Alzheimer's. And he was starting to get that. And I watched him today at this birthday party, which makes me so sad because I watch her see her husband slowly slipping away from my friend. And we love him so much, and he loves us. And um, I watch her hold him and tell him how to blow out a candle and how to like back off and don't touch the fire. And it's so sad because I look at that and think she would do anything to fight with him again and to be able to have the relationship they have. And we take for granted so much of what our spouse can do for us and what they can't do for us. And we fight over silly stuff like, you know, oh, you said this wrong about me or how could you treat me like this? How could you do this? And I look at her and I watch her love this man till the end. And he's so afraid of not remembering her. And there's times at night where he looks at her and he tells her, I know, I know you. And she says, you sure do. And she laughs and says, you do know me. And she, he'll go on for 30 minutes telling her, like, I've, I've seen you plenty of times, and he can't remember her. And then he comes out of it, and he realizes that he was gone for a while, and it makes him so sad. So these this chapter we're doing is all about conflict, and we all have them. I have spent more time this week with so many couples that are fighting. I mean, from high ministry down to our own children and their girlfriend. And there's been so much conflict this last two weeks. And... Um, everywhere i'm hearing couples that i mean it's like something's going on in the universe right now that couples are fighting more than ever and even us mm -hmm. and worse than we've ever done and um and you know everybody's degree is different some cuss some yell some scream some hit some throw some drink some you know whatever but when we say ours is bad it's bad for us and i look at these signs of conflict and i think if God told her, you can never fight with Randy again, if, if I heal him, she would say, I'll never fight with him again. And I think about that. I think I have a healthy husband, and I nitpick and fight over stuff that won't even matter in 20 years or 5 years or 10 years. And I, I think of this, and I, it's just, it's been an emotional day watching him. Did you see all that? Oh, yeah. 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 I just don't wear my emotions out on my sleeve quite as much as you do. But yes, it's... it's <laughs> It, it, it's perspective. It's, a, it's a, an amazing perspective that when it gets right down to it and when you're in the heat of an argument with your spouse, it's sometimes hard to remember this or to keep this perspective. But most of the time, it just doesn't really matter. That, that heat of that battle, the, the things that you're arguing about, 
just really don't matter in the grand scope of things. I mean, yes, we have to be respectful to each other's feelings, and we have to give grace, and, and we have to, to live, do our very best to live by the Word of God. Um, but remember, it, 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 when you're in the heat of that argument, number one, it's an opportunity for growth. What, what good can we get out of this? What good can come of this conflict? What appears bad, it's just like no weapon formed against you shall, shall prosper. Doesn't mean what, form. Right. The, that's a great analogy. The, the weapon may form. That weapon could be conflict between you and your spouse. But by the will of God, it shall not prosper. And you give the Holy Spirit the open door. You've accepted Jesus into your heart, but sometimes we take over the place of the Holy Spirit. We take over what we feel. We, we, can, we, we tell God, I got this. I can do this. I, I know how to handle this. Back off, God. I got this. I'll push you aside. Let me handle it. I got this. I can handle this. I'm a man. Or I'm a strong. She's a strong woman. But in... The grand scope of things, which is the reason why I, I read that thing that I read, for perspective, if we don't allow ourselves to learn how to have conflict in a positive way in relationships, especially in marriage, because marriage is, is your melting pot. It, is the, it should be the safest place for you to grow and learn. But unfortunately, a lot of times, we make it one of the most toxic places because we feel, whatever the feeling may be, whatever the history behind it may be, we treat our, our spouse worse than the, the guy standing on the corner. And, and so please, keep it in perspective when we talk about this chapter of conflict. And when he says that, we're putting ourselves on that same level. Absolutely. That we treat each other. We are standing up here, and we're, we, we're growing through this. I, I would like to say that for myself, I look back at the first seven years of marriage, or six years probably, and they were so easy. I even felt like at one point, and I never shared this with you, I thought, does he really love me? Do I really love him? I mean, why don't we ever fight? What is wrong with us? I mean, we really never fought. We could tell you the day and the place of where we were when we got in the conflict. Where was it? And I, for a while, I just thought that this just wasn't normal. And whew, that changed the last year and a half. And I am so grateful for every single conflict because I have asked some questions and I have grown and we're learning boundaries. Our coach told us, since we're so intertwined with real estate right now, that we're, he told me one sentence that changed me these last two weeks. He says, we had a disagreement when Jeff was getting ready in his closet over a situation with the client. And um, I, we started arguing, and for the first time ever, I wanted to close, I shut the door on him. And I've never done that to him. And I, want, I shut the door, like basically telling him to shut up, I don't want to hear it anymore. And he flung the door open, and I was like, whoa. I even remember, I remember my feelings saying, We've never done this part. This is all new because it's gotten heavier and heavier and heavier. And our coach said one thing to me, and I say, man, you're worth every penny. He says, you guys are no longer allowed to discuss real estate in any part of the house except one designated area, and both parties have to be there. And I thought, wow. So ours is the kitchen table. And for two weeks, since he's told us that, or a week and a half, we have not discussed or had a conflict in the house um, unless it's at that table, and we we both have to come to the table and say we're talking real estate. Because when we're home, we're husband and wife. We're not a business. And we never shut it off. And that was my saying. I look at him now, and I'm like, you never shut it down. Because I'm starting to see you pick it up, the real estate up, and the phone calls up more than even sometimes I do. So that one little sentence that they taught us was a boundary. Now, your boundary could be different. Go ahead. What Jim just said, when she closed the door on Jeff, did you feel like she said, shut up? Oh, absolutely. So some things that we do or some things we see, say, 
even though we're not saying it, we perceive them that yes. way, and it's just kind of like, you know, every time that we, we forget, we forget some things or something like that, and I'll say, hey, we were supposed to do that, and then she will say, uh, you know you didn't say that, and I'm not hearing that, I'm hearing, no, you're lying. Mm -hmm. And then that was kind of like, ah, you know, and it just, it just escalated. Mm -hmm. and so we're going to talk about conflict three, because that's what we do. So conflict three. Actually, that's also partially conflict six. Too. One, three and six. So when we talk, we're going to say these conflicts, and we're not going to cover them all in depth. You guys have a sheet. Mm -hmm. I would go home and ask your spouse. You read it yourself, please. Get the uh, book. Get the book, but I mean, read, the, read this. The book is the meat and potatoes. Jeff didn't take me to dinner to write this for you. And Jeff didn't go to breakfast with me today to write this for you. He spends a lot of time writing these out for you. Go through this by yourself and ask yourself, which one are we? Because there's six conflicts. And then let your spouse do that. And I looked at Jeff. I said, which conflict are we? And he said, three. And some are six. I said, bingo. We're three and some are six. I, I even had to, to put a couple of reference C page 177. Because there's just, I mean, there's a whole page of useful tips on when you're dealing with this specific type of conflict. It gives you a, a, literally a page, page and a half. Of, of hints on how to address, how to use, things to do, how to approach it. And we'd be here for, gosh, five, eight hours trying to get through all of that. And Jeff and, would love it. And I would love it. I would teach that class. Yeah, look at that. I'd, I'd be he's here He's not even going to teach it. It's not even on the <laughs> syllabus, and he's already happy. Um, can I'll, you, cr I'll create the class. Okay. Can you please do us a favor and read all six really quick? So if you don't have a, the, the printout that I made, There's so the, the six kinds of conflict, number one is sins of one spouse. Uh, number two is immaturity or brokenness of one person. Uh, three is hurt feelings that are no one's fault, which is really kind of interesting. Really number four, uh, conflicting desires. Number five, desires of one person versus the needs of the relationship. And number six, known versus unknown problems. And I actually was going to kind of start on number six, which is, three. which is unusual for me because I'm, I'm very linear and I like going one, two, three, four, five. I like things in order. Pray for us. But, <laughs> but number six is, 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 in my mind, a really, really important one simply for the fact that if you identify in your, in your relationship the conflicts that your that your spouse may not even be aware of. Uh, I'll give you a silly example. Um, your spouse brushes their teeth up and down instead of side to side. It's a silly example. They they don't know that they brush their teeth up and down versus side to side, but that may drive drive you buggy. It may drive you, in, you know, it's it's so so silly. But as an example, so so maybe as an example, tell me an, one of mine. Um, I was just gonna say because she was talking about the first first part of our marriage. Um, my brain was 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 kind of going. You you think there's a problem because your family you grew up with conflict. That if 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 there's not conflict, there's something wrong with the relationship. And she, she'll disagree with me. It's unknown. It's not something that she goes, you know what? You're absolutely right. I'm not comfortable unless there's some form of conflict. I don't receive that, and I don't believe that. <laughs> I will still live in that denial until God shows me otherwise. <laughs> now, I'll add a second piece to that. And this is why it's so amazing and why we're so transparent up here. Is God puts us together to be able to make one perfect human together because I need him and he needs me. And that's when we become one, when we can dance together with each other's differences. Got the second part right now of our marriage, the reason we're having conflict, because Jeff grew up in a household, when there's conflict, there's an end. His grandmother, his grandmother and grandfather, which is his mother's biological parents, were married till death do them part. The problem is, I asked Jeff, how was their relationship? Well, they were divorced. I said, they never divorced. I thought they were married. He goes, oh, yeah, they were divorced. And I said, really? I said, they weren't divorced. Say it in your own words, what did you say? They were divorced in every single way except for the legal way. And I said, what kind of marriage? How did they fight? He says, oh, by the time I was born, they were already... They were done. They were already done. They they had gotten past 
that I should have fought for, for him two years ago. They'd already gone past that point. So they stopped caring. He said they that went, to me. That's the word. I was waiting for him to say it. They stopped caring. I said, who told you? Did your grandma tell you that she stopped caring about your grandfather? And he said, no. And I said, did your grandfather tell you that she stopped caring? He stopped caring for your grandmother. And he said, no. And I said, so your mom must have told you they didn't care for each other. No, she never said that. And I said, so as a perception, growing up as a little boy, his perception was they were already divorced and didn't care about each other. No one told them. And that, so, so when Jeff sees conflict, when I show up so I can grow and stretch him, God's using me <laughs> to grow and stretch him, um, conflict to him is dangerous. And we, yes. could, we could end our divorce and still be married. See how that shows up for him? Did you say that one more time? We could what? We could be divorced and still be married, like your grandfather and grandmother. Oh, so, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, I see what you're saying. See, his brain won't even yeah, yeah. receive that. Yeah. But see, that's why conflict to him is so dangerous. That's why us arguing and God's like, we're just trying to get through some stuff. You're not going to be able to help enough people if you don't understand conflict and what it looks like. And, and I, now, say, I say it for you as much as I say it for myself, that conflict is good. Conflict is an opportunity for growth. But it hurts in every it, way it, so it much. It hurts, hurts me to my core. He's harmony and he's a relator. He would rather, if you laid a pile of a million dollars, and I'm not joking with this, I would go to the million dollars, and I would, and it has a million dollars, and has conflict on it, I would run to that corner. And I would say, I'll take the million, let's deal with the conflict. And they say, you can have zero, but you can have harmony. He would run to the zero. He would say, all day long, I'm going to this corner. That's where he's comfortable. So God says, well, you have to have this in you, Jeff, and Michelle, you have to have this so you guys can come together. And his number six is he's been coaching me, and I don't want him to. <laughs> this is what happens, what goes on with you guys. We talk about it. And is I never asked Jeff to be my coach. I paid $1,200 to talk to someone for 30 minutes a week, and I paid him to be my coach. And he's the one that taught me the one thing. I didn't want him to be my coach, and he coaches me. And this is the part where we have conflict. I show up in number three, and I think he does too. Yes. I agree. Number three is the type, um, typical patterns look like this. One of them feels hurt, me or him. The hurt person communicates as if the other one has sinned against them, me or him. The accused party gets defensive. They go to court defending their innocence. They end up alienated. The problem never gets resolved, and they go on forgetting about it the next day. What is important here is that we learn how to deal with the kind of hurt where no one is really wrong. When you are hurt, acknowledge it yourself. Communicate. Emphasize. Em, em, say it again? Emphasize. Emphasize. Oh, why did I say that wrong? Emphasize. Spanglish. Um, identify patterns in pain. Be in a healing mode. Guard against going to court. I go to court with him. And when I read this chapter, I go to court because I there's a winner. And there's a loser. And I didn't know I was doing that. that she's day, really good at it in business. And that day in the closet, I was done. He was being charged guilty, and I was shutting that door. And I'm like, you're going to jail behind this door right now. She had presented her case <laughs> to the jury. And I'm like, I'm done. Shut up. I didn't say shut up because I'm thinking, oh, I'm not going to speak bad in my the husband. Defense but I shut the door, and I told him everything with my body language. And I was done. And here, here's what we do know. We do a lot of stuff wrong, but we do know that we need to be quick to apologize. I immediately call one of my girlfriends and she talks me down and says all this stuff about how great he is and this and that and, and I'm crying and everything else. And Which having having people like that, godly people around you, to feed the word of God into you, that he may have not acted in a, in a godly way at this moment in time, but he is a child of the Most High God and that at his heart is the Holy Spirit and if you give Give him grace, give him forgiveness, that that will allow you know the Holy Spirit to come back into him and into the marriage. She told me, me and my, she was me and my spouse um, have been have been trying to avoid each other for two days because they have been fighting. That's why I'm telling you, I've talked to people in high places this week, and people. When I say high, I mean spiritual beings where they've been together and really been working through these things. And a healthy adult, all the way to young teenagers, and the conflict has been heavy these last two weeks in people's families. And 
when she said that to me, she says, I, she was listening to me, but she said, I don't want to focus on what happened. I want to focus on you being able to call and just say, I'm sorry for what I did. Whatever it is you did, Michelle. She didn't want to hear what I did, and she wasn't asking. She said, the problem isn't resolved. You're just going to say you're sorry, so you're the first one asking for forgiveness. And it was tough. I did it for her. I didn't do it for him. Listen to what I said there. I did it for her, not for him. That's why you have these spiritual people in your life. Because if I were to call Pastor Joel and he would have told me to do it, I would have, I would have texted him and texted Pastor Joel back and said, I did it. Because I wanted Pastor Joel to be proud of me. And that's what I wanted with my girlfriend. I wanted her to say, I'm so proud of you and you did it. So when she is, I'm telling her the same thing, she'll do it for me. I knew that's what I needed to do. But in our own place, if we stay there, I will continue to stew through it because the enemy's like, yes, I need to divide and conquer you too. Because there's an anointing on you that you're going to bless my people and I need to stop you too. And that's what he's after. And he's also after our children and our grandchildren. We've been standing in agreement for our son and his girlfriend and his fears and anxieties of getting married. The enemy's going to fight us because he sees what we are doing. And he knows, and this is a thing I stick to women and has helped me so much. And Mama Doty taught me this. Whenever you have offense, someone has offense to you, or you have offense towards somebody else, you hinder your prayer that you're praying for. And we're praying for a whole lot of things. A, and a lot, lot of people. And a whole lot of people. So every time I choose to stay angry at him because he hurt my feelings, because that's what it is. He hurt me. He offended my feelings. And my gloves come up. When I stay in that mode, I'm so selfish towards all of you, towards our children, towards my future grandchildren. I basically open a door and say, future grandchildren, my children, all our marriage ministry, all our business and clients, you guys are not important to me. It's all about me, and I'm going to be selfish. And when I think of that, I'm like, whoa, that's a big price to pay. And I immediately want to apologize. I'm not done with the offense. So I'm not telling you. I didn't forgive him. I still have two things I have to talk to him about. I haven't told you. But, um, Can we talk? <laughs> yeah. And I've had two words I've been carrying around that he said this week. And you probably know what those two words were. And we were sitting in our office. And, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I have been biting my tongue and saying, Lord, let me get through Saturday's class. And I said, if you want me to bring them up in a gently, kind way, because see, I'm supposed to be, I am, I what I need to Love be, to hear and this is what this chapter says, I need to be very gentle with Jeff when I tell him those two things that hurt me, and I need to be very harsh on the situation. And, and so, say that again. Right, right. But what I want to, I want to highlight is on conflict number five, what Michelle was talking about. Five or six. Five. Uh, the desires of one person versus the needs of the relationship. So I put this, I think this is the only one that I put in all caps because this one really jumped out at me. Um, marriage means giving up some individual, what we perceive, I put quotations, what we perceive as our rights. That's a whole other class, whole other, whole other discussion. But marriage means giving up some individual rights for the sake of the marriage. But sometimes, this is what I love to hear, the marriage returns the favor and sacrifices for the individual in the end. The marriage benefits as each marriage, I'm sorry, each member grows. And because sometimes the desire of one spouse conflicts with the need of the relationship, no relationship is going to thrive if the, the member gets their individual needs met, but the relationship always suffers. It's good for a relationship at times to serve its members. In the end, the marriage benefits as each member grows, but keep it in balance, making sure that the marriage also gets served first. And then page 190 gives you a whole list of things that you can do to, 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 to help that process through. So she was talking about the things that she did. She wanted to confront. She wanted to conflict. She wanted to go to court. And she made the choice to call her friend and, and her friend talk her through it, give her positive reaffirming words. Um, 
and that in turn fed the relationship, which means at some point down the road, our relationship is going to feed her, grow her, lift her, whatever it is that she may need, which in turn is a benefit as well for the relationship and for me. Because if she's thriving, if she's succeeding, if she's getting lifted up, if she's getting in, fed, fed into, so am I. And I love that. The one thing I was going to tell you that I said we do a lot of things still wrong, Jeff and I. What? But the, the, the two things we do right is we run a good council, and we've been telling you this for four or five years. We finally got good council. And whether you pay for it or whether you have it, and that good counsel cannot be somebody in your family that you eat Thanksgiving with, someone in your family that is a brother or sister or mother, it's too close. And we have good counsel to run to. And the second thing we do is we always come back and say, I am sorry, please let's pray together. The problem, the reason we stay in three though, is we never sit down and go deep enough to say, where did that root from? Why did you say that with you? That's she known gets, versus unknown. Problems. Yes. She gets to tell him, why do you think I'm calling you a liar? And he gets to say, well, when I hear you say, you didn't say that to me. We didn't say we were going to Michelle and Jeff's house on Sunday. I was going shopping with my mom to buy her medicine and everything. He's like, I've told you for two weeks we're going to Michelle's at five on Sunday. And he, she says, no, you didn't. No, you didn't. And he says, you're calling me a liar. See, somewhere along the way, no disrespect, no disrespect, is you have been, you have that feeling, and that feeling's been brewing, and when she says that to you, it raises something up that's been going on inside you. When I did that to Jeff and shut the door on his face, and then I'm saying, girl, I don't have to talk to her anymore. That's what I would have said. He's like, you're not going to shut the door. I'm going to have the last word. Something rose up in him, and I no, already know. It had nothing to do with I'm going to have the last word. I know. Word. I'm going to tell you what it was. Jeff does not like to be slapped, which they're not in the cap. Yeah, I'm slapped, <laughs> hung up, or abandonment. Those are his issues. So when I disrespect him because he's honor and respect, I disrespect him to the highest level by closing that door and telling him, you're not worth it. You don't have a voice. You're not valid. Yes. And you know where I question him at that I'll be very, very vulnerable with you guys? Is, and this is my bag of goods, is I grew up in a household of women, and my mom and dad divorced very young when I was young. And um, it was my mom, my grandma, and my four sisters until my baby sister was born. And um, we're strong women. And I always, without saying it to him, and he reminds me all the time, when I shut the door that day, I've been telling him for eight years, I don't need you. I can do this on my own. I can make a million dollars. I can run my business. I can run my house. And you're not going to disrespect me. I immediately become the head of our household. And then he says, remind them. Man, a man has failed you. Men have failed you. Remind them who you are when you told them you were when you first dated them. Because he better, excuse my language, he better straighten his shit out. That's what I'm telling him when I shut the door in his face. And I never say it, but he knows it. And it's so disrespectful. He's a godly man that the Lord loves, and he's honor and respect, and I know that. And I'm security. The reason I act like that is because I'm a afraid little girl. And I don't want to lose him. But that little afraid little girl is afraid to lose him, so we take over and we put full leadership roles on. And it's so dangerous. And I've seen it. And then we go to court and we start pointing fingers at each other. You're not going to disrespect me. You're not going to talk to me like this. You're not going to treat me like this. And that's the court he talks about. And instead of just saying, hey, like, I'm really scared right now. I, we've never talked to each other this way. I'm afraid that you're going to get angry and you're going to walk out or whatever. And instead of him saying, I'm afraid that you could live without me. Instead of going deep like that, we go to court. Yes, you're absolutely correct. Absolutely correct. And, and for, for conflict number six, um, um, this, this is for my brain because I really like being analytical. That's a known conflict. What she just covered is a known conflict. 
Now, if she turns her head and kind of cocks it and raises an eyebrow at me and it causes something in me, I don't know where that's from. I haven't, I haven't gone, and she doesn't do that. I'm just using that as an example. It, it, to me, it's kind of, kind of a, silly, a silly example, but as an example, if she did that to me, and I'd be like, what the heck is your problem? And he does do that. Over something else. Like yeah. <laughs> and that's what one of the conflicts say. He is bringing out, that's not a good question. Because the only thing I can defend is, I don't have a problem, you have a problem. That's never going to resolve anything. If anything, he's going to say, honey, what are you afraid of? How can I help you? Or that where, where does that come from? Yeah. Because that, I, I think, where does that come from? Where where does that emotion come from? And it's all um, in the tonality. If he says, honey, where does that come from? Right, he said, like, right. where does that, where come, does that from? come from? And where I'm like, oh. uh, you better calm down. <laughs> um, so I'm going to say something for Jeff. But, is the but, most real quick, but real quick. On the unknown, this is this is the the fun fun interesting thing. <laughs> is it fun? It, 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 Sometimes, if you take conflict the right way, yes. But um, in an if you don't know why, I don't know why I react that way. The tonality, asking the question of ah, that that kind of hurt my feelings. Where did that come from? If you have the uh, have have the grace, because this chapter talks all about grace. Talks all about compassion. Talks all about empathy. Because in conflict, if you allow the Holy Spirit to cover you with grace, OMG, your conflict turns into growth. Versus letting the enemy, another foot in, crack that door just a little bit, here comes the enemy going, got them now, yep. got them now. Now I'm going to go after their kids. Now I'm going to go after their friends. Now I'm going to go after their business. Now I'm going to go after their class. And the only reason God would allow that, because God knows everything before it happened, is because he wants to see how strong we are and how much we're planted so he can move us to another level. And the sooner that happens and you're done with the conflict, it's, it's amazing. It's like you're healed. And the great thing about conflict, it, it, while we're trying to keep this, this good mindset about conflict, is that's God giving you the opportunity to grow and move into your next blessing. That's a great thing about conflict. I call it graduating from kindergarten to first grade, first grade to second grade. God's going, here's the open door for you. Walk into your blessing. Open, the door is open. Conflict is over. You've learned. You've grown. Move into your next blessing. Yep. So one thing I wanted to add is that um, the most important um, woman in Jeff's life before I came along was his mother. He is his mother. And his mother is, he adores her. He loves her. He shouts from the rooftop what an amazing lady she is. And he loves her. And she loves him. And what is interesting is, that relationship with him and his mother, he has no other relationship like that. So when I show up any different than his mother, to him, that's his safe, secure, he could tell his mother anything, anything, anything he could tell his mom that he would feel safe with. When I show up anything other than that, it's hurt and pain for him. And I think that's really interesting because I tell him, with his mom, the only time him and his mom ever fought when he was in college, it was explosive. And, and in his eyes, it was over. So no It was wonder, world ending, yes. It was world ending. No wonder when I come with conflict and say, you brush your teeth wrong. I don't tell him that. But um, there's other stuff. When I tell him, like, oh, you did that wrong at work, or I hate your driving, or you're mean to me, or whatever it is, that's so painful to him. And if I can remember when I show up how it crushes him, then I could stop doing it. If she knew that you think she's calling you a liar, have you addressed that with her? Yeah. And what's your answer to that? You told me that I was lying. That's how uh, I did. She'll say now, I don't remember. Yeah, that, that, and that's then what it was. And I'll find it now. Right. Now, just uh, like, oh, you did that? She goes, I don't remember. And then, but she changed it. But, it. but I think naturally it came off. No, you think, oh, no, I don't remember. And then she did that one time. 
So no. when she, you have said that ever again, mm -hmm. like, oh, you didn't tell me that. Do you stop yourself now and say, I'm calling, he thinks I'm calling him a liar? Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because now that you're aware of it, that was the unaware, number six. If you're aware of it, then you get to decide if you're not going to do that to him. Now, here's the powerful and the problem. She knows what pushes his button. So only she can choose if she's not going to go there. And that's what happens when you're vulnerable with your spouse. And great conflict will be having the agreement that it's okay to address that pattern. Not, not in a spiteful way, not in a pointing your fingers way, not in a demeaning way. It, and, and we can go back to that question of where did that come from? That's a great way to go, you're doing it again without going, you're doing it again. Because we do that to each other. Because I'm like, I know, I'm calling you a liar. We would do that. You're that's doing where it we, again. That's where he felt safe to explain it. And then I go and throw it in his face. Just said something to me interesting the other day. Just always in coach mode. Always in coach mode. And it irritates me sometimes. 85% of the time it irritates me. 95% of the time it irritates me. I wanted to finish the decorations How in the dining room. Them? And... I didn't think anything about it. We were off work. Jeff was relaxing on the couch. He was playing his video game. That's his decompression That's time. Funny. And I just, he knew I had to, I couldn't reach some of these things I was putting up on some real old shutters. Mm -hmm. and, and I needed his help. And he came up and he didn't think of his coaching mo mode. He comes up, he says, how long did your stepfather lay on the couch? And I'm like, what? I'm already going to fight. I already put one glove on when you asked me that question because I already know you're in coach mode. Yeah, I did not go about that the right I'm way. I'm like, <laughs> guess what I started to think as a female about oh, when yeah. we decorate and clean the house and they say, you know, one of those questions, I started thinking, I've done all the tree, I've done all of this, da da da. I started thinking all that because I knew that's what he was saying. Like, I'm relaxing and because of your messed up past and your father, stepfather laying on the couch, I'm suffering from it. That's what I heard. That's what you heard. Yeah. Isn't it crazy? And the, the book actually has a long, long part of the chapter specific to that. And what did I say to you? I'm like, he had a job. It doesn't matter. It has nothing to do with my Christmas stuff. Because I'm like, if he jumps on the crazy cycle, we're about to go around. He's like, <laughs> he's like just put our gonna... court stuff back on. Yeah, and he goes, and he says, what do you need nailed? Because he's like, let me nail. Let me run out of this court. Let me go back and lay on the couch. What and do you I'm, need? What does it look like? And where do you want it? He's like, I'm out of here. That was funny because you do go into that coachy mode. I it, well, the funny thing is, is, is she asked me the question while I was on the couch, and it probably took me at least three minutes to get from the couch to there. At least three minutes because I was thinking, how do I ask this question? <laughs> Why ask the question? So, women, I want to ask you: When you call your husband, do you call him so that he'll come in five to ten minutes, or do you call him so he'll come now? Thank you. Men, if you call your wife and he calls me and says, I need your help, I'm like, what? What can I help you with? We don't say, let me think about it for three to five minutes. Let me think how I'm going to coach you and let me ask him how I'm going to do this. We don't. What were you going to say? The same thing. I mean, if she brings up, it's like I'm on her way. Like, I'm, I'm watching TV. I'm always turning around seeing if she needs something. Because if not, she's going to argue about something. She's going to think, oh, oh, you're doing all this work and you're comfortable watching TV. I'm like, all right, I'll go check on her. What do you want? I don't need your help. Like, whether I do it You're like, like whoo! Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it don't be afraid of what I'm like. It takes that long. <laughs> and you open that door. And you're pointing at her too. She does the same to you? Yeah. You know what? And that's healthy conflict. That's healthy conflict. Because if if you know, mm -hmm. if you know at a certain point that she's going to say, why are you doing it? I need your help. I don't have to do this. Do the damage. And you, you're proactively going to her which kudos to you for being proactive. So the, the conflict is you're not all that that happy that you have to go and check in to make sure that she's not going, why isn't he here helping you? Whatever. So having that conversation of, hey, honey, did you know that I come and I check in on you just to make sure that I don't get in trouble or, or whatever that is? You wouldn't like and, that and, word. Have, and having that conversation what an incredible opportunity. That's awesome. What an incredible opportunity. Now, here's the other thing. Woo! Good job. Credit for him. I already put another bag. 
Dice everywhere. Like, oh, that's awesome. Everywhere. Are you demoing your house well, 10 times? What I want to tell you is that if you know that's their behavior, you can go to them and say, hey, I'm going to rest on the couch for an hour or two. Do you need anything before I go lay down? And if he would say that to me. Oh, OMG. If you can tell me at the beginning of the day, I'm going to need your help probably around noon. How am I supposed to know? This is what I told him. I'm going to time block. Here's what. We, we, need, we, need, we need to do this. 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 Perfect. Let me put that in that compartment, that compartment. This will happen at this time. This will happen at this time. I can relax right here. So here's what I told him. I'm going to put on the schedule because he likes the schedule. And he's like, have you looked at the schedule? I'm going to put need Jeff every few hours. And I'm like, if I don't need you, you get the time back. And so so he knows. Look at how happy he gets. I'm going to need Jeff so he'll be prepared. And if he comes and says, hey, you said you needed me at 3 o'clock. It's Jeff time. Yeah. And I'm like, it's all good. You can relax, do whatever you need to do. But that's those are healthy ways to fight. Are you going to say something? Oh, my gosh. OMG? Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. This is, yeah. Um, one last thing I wanted to share in, uh, is. Don't read that. What were you going to say? Uh, well, we have someone at our house, so she's texting me. I want to see if she's okay. Okay. Um, yeah, what were you going to say? <laughs> so to wrap up, um, please take some time today, tonight, or early tomorrow. And if you, if you have the handout, if you don't have the handout, go get the book. But if you've got the handout, just kind of go, okay, so number one, uh, or even ask the question with each other, what, what she asked me when we were sitting in here earlier today. Which one are we? Which one are we? How do we find which, which one do you think uh, is, is the one that's most re relevant to us? So please, take some time to do that. And if you feel your heartbeat starting to go up into the 110s and the 120s, I know what I was going to say. Say, can we breathe? Can, breathe? can we pray together? So one thing I learned a couple weeks ago, and um, again, we've been researching the mind and what happens and things like that, and we were in an amazing conference, is it's energy that's being built up. So when he says something to me like, you were very disrespectful to Jennifer and Mike and um, you made her cry, or you, she wanted to cry, and I really didn't think I did that. And I'm getting frustrated and mad. He's like, you're always mean to our friends. And, you know, he didn't say this. This is not whatever happened. But if he said that to me, and I go to zero to ten, and it's anger and energy that's being built up inside of me. And what happens to your nervous system is that you become fight or flight. And I want to fight. That's how I show up. I want to fight with him. If he comes to me and says, I'm so sorry, I didn't mean it that way, and he touches me or rubs my shoulder or, or even your nervous system, there's something in our nervous system that calms you down when someone touches you. That's why when someone is at the hospital or whatever, they'll usually touch a hand or um, a shoulder or whatever it is because they're trying to take their pulse, and they, their nervous system starts to slow down and calm down. It's energy that's built up inside of us, and we release it. The problem is, is how we release it and what goes on. If you look at the situation, we got to go into that. So the one thing, if you look at the situation and say, what did I just say right there that really caused that reaction or hurt? And what does that mean to you, Jeff? And when I asked him that, and I asked him about a particular number that we were both being heated about, he wanted a lower number for our goals, and I wanted a higher number. And he said, if you put that higher number, it makes me feel like... Um, your exact word was we're gonna fail we're gonna fail because he lives in reality and he doesn't he's not a visionaire and I say he asked me what does that feel if you put my number down and I said it makes me feel like we already failed so we were both saying the same thing except we had to come to a compromise that maybe it's not my number maybe it's not his number. she's a visionary and I'm an implementer yes and if the goal's too small I already feel like we lost if the goal's too big, he feels like we're going to lose. So it's learning how to meet in the middle. It's the same thing with sex. It's the same thing with cleaning. It's the same thing with cooking. It's the same thing with hanging out with your friends. If you want to go out three days a week to eat dinner and your spouse wants to go out once, if you go out once, you feel defeated, and they won. If you go out three times, they feel defeated. 
It's the same thing with marriage and it's the same thing with business. It's the same thing with arguing. You have to meet in the middle. So you go out to eat, you know, one and a half times that week instead of three or one. You just, it's always a compromise. And so that conflict can be growth. Conflict, conflict is definitely growth. Can be growth. Yes. Yes. So and on that, we're going to wrap up. Wrap it up. Go ahead and pray. Thank you, Father, for the words that we spoke today, Father. We thank you for conflict. We thank you that conflict, Father, is Healthy not conflict. Yeah, conflict is not evil or bad. That we ask that you teach us all how to fight fairly, Father, and that most of all, that whenever we have a disagreement or we hear things that are not correct, Father, that you will be slow to speak, um, quick to forgive, slow to speak, and slow to anger, Father. We thank you, Father, as the words leave our mouth, that our spouse will hear beautiful uplifting things that get to their ears father we thank you father <laughs> as we go through life and we're not perfect and we're growing each other father that we always remember we're on the same team father and that we're not a jury we're not going to be in courts we're not going to ever ever leave one another but we're going to fight for one another that we're going to lift each other up and never tear each other down we thank you father that you'll bless every single marriage here every single marriage that watches this video that they will be a loving <laughs> graceful partner to their spouse father we thank you father that when the couples go home that they will do your work and seek out your word in jesus mighty name amen, amen. thank you guys